I don't know if I have to officially open this meeting. If not, okay, it's officially open. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it that way. This is a little bit of an unusual meeting for eWeb. Um, our normal board meetings are full of actions and uh, votes and things like that. Uh, the one that we do up in McKenzie Valley is a little bit more about the interaction and the questions and, and talking with uh, people within uh, this part of our service territory. Uh, and so it's a little bit different in format. Um, what we will do, and I guess I'll start with uh, an introduction of the commissioners that we do have here now. Uh, Vice President John Brown uh, is here, uh, Commissioner John Borofsky, and Commissioner Matt McCray. Um, the two that may wander in at some point is our uh, board president, Mindy Schlossberg, and also uh, Commissioner Sonia Carlson. So they may come in at any moment. If you see two people scurrying in at the last minute and sitting over here, those are the two. Um, we're going to do uh, a presentation series. Uh, the, the whole hope of this is to give you some ideas on some of the things that we're working on. Uh, they're, I'll call them topical trailers or teasers. They're really three minutes each, uh, covering everything from wildfire mitigation to customer programs, uh, watershed recovery, uh, and what's going on with some of our licenses. Uh, for the, the, the generating sites and a few other things. We have five of them. They're about three minutes long. Uh, the purpose of those is just to give you some ideas about things that we're working on and also to inspire some conversation and some questions. And then we, were really, we will open up the floor to customer and, um, and uh, uh, stakeholder input and questions. The board is here to interact and, and listen. Um, and that's really our primary purpose, to share information and have a discussion. And so with that, I will turn it over to our first presenter, who is right behind me, Lisa. I assume that's your mic, Frank, so I'll take I'll steal one. it. Yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? Does this work? All right. Good evening. It's nice to see so many people here. It's nice to see so many people here tonight. Um, my name's Lisa Krentz. I'm eWeb's electric generation manager. And here with me tonight is Mark Zinnaker. He's our generation engineering supervisor. I'll be providing a brief update on the Lieberg Canal and our decision-making process going forward. So as I'm sure all of you know, the Lieberg Canal has been out of service, so effectively dewatered since late 2018, following areas of increased seepage in the earthen embankment. Over the last several years, we've uh, completed additional studies and we found um, areas of low strike soils that could potentially become unstable in the event of an earthquake. Uh, throughout last year, we completed uh, additional risk assessment workshops to get a better handle on the issue and identify what investments would be needed to safely return the canal to service for the purposes of power generation. Those results were presented to the eWeb board in February of this year. Now, based on those cost estimates, woo, <laughs> all right. If you are asleep, you're not anymore. Um, based on those cost estimates, it's, it's abundantly clear that the, um, the investments required in terms of canal improvements will likely substantially exceed um, what we would expect to get back in power generation. So we're currently exploring other options for the future of the canal. Uh, we understand um, that the decision to either return the canal to service or to continue to operate it as a stormwater conveyance, which is essentially how we've been operating it since 2018, impacts more than just economics. The Libra Canal has been a feature in the Mackenzie Valley for 90 years, during which time a portion of the Mackenzie River has been diverted through it and residences and businesses have grown up around it. Recognizing that we're taking a triple bottom line approach, um, so that our eWeb board can better understand the consequences of their decision. What that means is we'll be looking at um, environmental and social uh, issues in addition to the economic drivers. Um, we've already started that work by identifying a list of the potential environmental, social, and economic components of each uh, decision, so either returning the canal to service for power generation or continuing to operate it as a stormwater conveyance. That list includes a host of issues, from regulatory requirements to irrigation and water rights issues, um, fish and water quality impacts, and replacement power, among others. So for example, what is eWeb able to do under our operating license from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission? 
along with other regulatory requirements that we're subject to. Um, now, most of the things on this list will require more research to understand the impact. So we intend to use the list as a roadmap of sorts to get to the place where the eWeb board can make an informed decision. Uh, we've already begun extensive research on regulatory re um, requirements and water rights, and we'll present both the larger issue list and our preliminary findings on those two topics uh, to the eWeb board at our August meeting, so just a couple of months from now. Uh, the other thing we're doing, aside from a uh, decision-making process for the future of the canal, is we're going to be doing some canal improvements, likely over the next few years, um, to ensure that the canal is able to convey stormwater in the short term. So this work would be um, highlighted in areas where the canal might experience um, high flows from tributary creeks during storm events. So with that, um, Mark and I are happy to take questions during the question and answer session. And I also wanted to let you know that we have a couple of other information tables um, for you inside. Uh, so after we're done with this portion of the meeting, one for our Carmen Smith project, hydroelectric project, and another for dam safety and emergency accent action plans. So with that, I will say thank you very much. Um, it's nice, again, nice to see so many people here. And I will pass it on to our next speaker, which is Frank. Thank you, Lisa. You didn't notice, but they did walk in behind the scenes. So Commissioner uh, uh, Sonia Carlson and President Schlossberg did make it through the accident. So, um, and you didn't miss a whole lot. So. I have the pleasure this evening of talking to you about um, rates in particular. And uh, one of the things that we've been considering and dig uh, give you a quick update on the potential for a McKinsey Valley electricity rate. So as a little bit of background, public utilities uh, develop rates out of really doing two processes. One is through budgets and financial measurements and forecasts. They develop what's called a revenue requirement. And this is really just the total amount of money that a utility needs to operate. And then they use what's called a cost of service analysis to determine how those costs get divided between different customer classes like residential and commercial, for example. Or, for example, between what's a basic charge and what's an energy charge. And so we're in process of both. Um, a few years ago, one of the commissioners, uh, with concurrence of the rest of the board, asked uh, us to do a cost of service analysis on comparing the cost between the Eugene metro area and the McKenzie Valley. So we, over the last couple of years, we did that cost of service analysis. Uh, we also worked with a consultant who deals with utilities on these types of matters. And it showed that the people of the McKenzie Valley, our customers, were not um, covering the costs specific to this area. Uh, the difference was about 14%, just so you know. So based on that board request, but really driven by a lot of the events over the last year, the board has not chosen to pursue or look into that type of issue at this, at this time. Although one of the things that we're doing this fall is we are doing and looking at the cost of service analysis across the entire utility for multiple years. And so while the board has not chosen at this time to establish a rate for the McKenzie Valley separate from a rate from Eugene that will be part of the discussions that occur this fall. Typically what we do is really between October and December there will be a, at least two public hearings on the topic as well as probably an initial proposal meeting. Um, so at this time we have done an analysis. It does show some cost differences but further discussion this fall with the board on what that really means and whether, there will, uh, whether they will choose to establish a McKenzie Valley electricity rate that would be separate from our uh, urban rate for the citizens of Eugene. And so, more to come. Um, a lot more activity this fall. We'll be happy to answer questions on that uh, later if need be. Um, but I'll just pass it off at this point to talk about something that's a little more pleasant than rates, uh, which is um, our work in the McKenzie watershed, and I'll pass that off to Carl Morgenstern. Thank you, Frank. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight, and what I'd like to do is just uh, 
Talk to you about what we're doing in the McKenzie to help uh, with the watershed recovery and restoration. Um, obviously, the whole day farm fire has impacted thousands of lives up here, turned people's lives upside down, and I think as a as a community, we've responded to uh, to help build back and and support each other. And that's kind of the work we're doing up here. Uh, uh, Eweb is working with uh, our partners in the Pure Water uh, Partner Program. Um, who is the Watershed Council, and the Soil Water Conservation District, McKenzie River Trust, and others, to really embark on a partnership with landowners that have been impacted by the fire to help rebuild smarter and, and better. Um, and so, as we've done this work, uh, we really are, are focused on trying to help uh, those that, that ask for help and want help so that maybe there's one part of your lives if they've been impacted that maybe you don't need to pay as much attention to because we're helping you collectively with that. And so EWEB and the Pure Water uh, Partners uh, agencies and organizations that we work with, the Watershed Council, like I said, and Soil Water Conservation District, responded to the fire as soon as we were able to get access to the watershed and responded with the initial million dollars that the board approved to help us with uh, stabilizing ash and debris and keeping that out of the river and erosion control and then revegetation. And so um, basically what, what we're able to do as a Pure Water Partners program is as we were working before the fire to help landowners uh, restore and protect riparian forests. And so we'd do riparian assessments on landowner properties and then work with them to develop a management plan. So what we're able to do is just pivot and, and start doing burn assessments and then help with the erosion control and designing uh, and planting and so forth. So the emergency phase, emergency response phase of our uh, watershed recovery efforts is, is now done. We finished that in May. And that included uh, basically, like I said, stabilizing ash and debris, uh, doing erosion control and revegetation on over 300 properties. And so um, that work and, and revegetating on about 90 acres on across 89 properties. So that effort has kind of wound down. And now uh, in May, basically what happened was we uh, received $200,000 from ODF Oregon Department of Forestry to do fuels work and so but that money has to be spent by this month and so really we had to pivot and and try to use that money quickly to do uh, fuels work uh, to help landowners on uh, 25 different properties that work is continuing um, and now we're kind of shifting gears now that that work is winding down that we're basically in a, in a transition phase to look at um, doing reassessments on landowners properties to look at a host of things that we can help with. Uh, one is uh, invasive weeds that are starting to grow and, and pop up obviously everywhere. Um, we have an early detection rapid response uh, program partnership where we can identify them, we can then respond and help. Uh, also continuing the fuels work um, and then uh, planning for revegetation this coming winter. And then also looking at erosion issues that might hit us this coming winter uh, that we can help with. And so what we're gonna be doing uh, in the next couple of weeks is doing outreach to the over 350 landowners that are, that are in the Pure Water Partners Program, and this includes those uh, pre-fire, to basically do these assessments that really look at the whole property and identify areas that we might be able to help, and then write a recommendations back to the landowner, and then they can figure out and, and work with us on what they wanna work with us on moving forward. And so that's kind of where we are um, with that. And the other piece, uh, when we, we're also doing work in the floodplain on large scale and small scale, um, uh, work in the McKenzie River Trust and the Fen Rock Reach to restore the, for at least the first phase of the Fen Rock Reach this summer. Um, and so it's a large scale restoration to connect the river back to the floodplain. And these floodplain restoration projects basically help to kind of spread out the flow, slow down the, the, the flow of the water and drops out the sediment attenuates water uh, and, and metals and nutrients. So there, this is kind of this area that, you know, we're, we're looking at doing these in a number of different areas around the watershed. Uh, another one is Quartz Creek. Um, and so those efforts are, are ongoing uh, as far as planning and getting ready for implementing those in the future years. And the other piece is, is on a smaller scale is working with landowners uh, who live in the floodplain or floodway and whose homes were destroyed who are looking to maybe not rebuild and want other options of what to do. And so uh, recognizing that, we'd like to offer an option for those landowners that are thinking about that to 
to work with us and McKenzie River Trust to basically sell the property towards to conservation. And then we'd restore it into a, a floodplain uh, property. And so working with McKenzie River Trust, they've secured three uh, acquisitions in, in the floodway and are, are currently in conversation with seven others. Um, so McKenzie and EWeb, McKenzie River Trust and EWeb are partnering on that and, and basically both are, are sharing the cost of that 50-50. And so, um, so that, that is ongoing and, and will continue. Um, and then the other, uh, I guess, piece to, to kind of bring it to a close is the funding side. And so EWeb's board uh, last um, uh, March, I guess it was, uh, approved a, a surcharge on our water customers of, on average, well, on average, actually the majority of them will be about $3 a month um, for the, for the water, average water customer. And so that's gonna be a surcharge that will last for five years, will sunset after that. And that's uh, essentially generated about $12 million that will be used in watershed restoration up here. And so um, that's in addition to the million that was approved for the emergency response efforts. And so that money is then uh, going to be used to, uh, for the next five years to do some of the things we're talking about, um, especially floodplain efforts, restoration efforts, uh, helping to incentivize rebuilding and help with rebuilding. And Nancy will talk about those, those programs uh, next. And then finally, uh, you know, EWeb is working with our Pure Water partners and uh, the Lane County to really seek out other state federal funding that, that can leverage uh, this investment that EWeb is making. And so we're working, uh, you know, not only with FEMA and, and others, but also with our with our elected representatives to identify. Basically, we we've I have about 20 million that is in process of either promised to us, or we've applied for, or we've received. And so there's uh, quite a bit of money that uh, we're trying to get to help us in this effort up in the up in the watershed. Um, so I think that's about it. And I'll just we, obviously we'll be next door like everybody else. And we have a table, so if you want to have questions to stop by and talk about your situation, happy to do that. Um, but I'll hand it over to Nancy to talk about landowner incentive programs that we've developed. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for being here tonight. I wanted to briefly outline some of our incentive programs that we've set up for landowners who have been affected by the Holiday Farm Fire. The first one I wanted to talk about is our home site relocation program. So in this program, EWEB will provide up to $7,000 in grant funding to eligible homeowners in the fire perimeter who move their building footprints away from the river, both in an effort to rebuild smarter and be protective of water quality. Specifically, property owners who move their building footprints outside of the riparian setback, which is typically 50 feet for residences, or out of the floodplain area will be eligible for $2,000 in advance of construction once the land use and building permits have been issued by Lane County. And additionally, EWA will offer grant funding for landowners who incur out-of-pocket expenses to relocate their home site. And this will be done on a 50% um, reimbursement basis for these expenses, not to exceed $5,000. And this type of uh, expense could include things like moving septic drain field lines or altering your well infrastructure in order to accommodate for the new location of the building footprint. And landowners who are not able to move their building footprint or it's already outside of the riparian setback are still eligible for grant funding uh, to in install advanced septic systems that are more protective of water quality. Another program we have is the Septic System Zero Interest Loan Program. So we offer these zero interest loans up to $20,000 for homeowners who need to replace or make major repairs to their septic systems. And we do still have our $250 rebate program uh, that's designed for regular septic system maintenance every uh, three years or so. And then finally, we have our undergrounding of electric service lines. So EWeb has uh, been willing to invest in underground service lines wherever it's practical for customers rebuilding within the fire perimeter uh, who require substantial repair or full replacement of their service lines. So those are the three EWeb incentive programs and more information can be found on our website at eweb.org slash hff resources or you can always email us at watershedrecovery at eweb.org. And I wanted to talk about two other things briefly. 
Uh, Carl mentioned our Pure Water Partners program earlier, and we still have our naturescaping pathway, and this uh, encourages and provides recommendations for the use of native plants in riparian areas, particularly between homes and the river, to protect water quality and reduce erosion concerns uh, and also provide things like wildlife habitat. And right now, over the summer, we're working with the U of O Landscape Architecture Department to develop a guide that incorporates these naturescaping practices uh, with firewise landscaping practices, and that will be available likely in the fall. So that will be a resource that we can hand out to landowners and will likely have a naturescaping firewise type workshop in the fall as well to give folks suggestions as you're rebuilding uh, properties. And then finally, I wanted to talk about a, a newer initiative for um, Mackenzie Firewise communities. So the Pure Water Partners Program, Oregon Department of Forestry, Mackenzie Fire, and Upper Mackenzie Fire are working to develop uh, Firewise communities in the watershed. And so this program is a voluntary program developed by the National Fire Prevention Association to essentially encourage communities to work together to become more fire resilient. And we're currently looking for landowners to either serve on the board or to just participate in the program. And it doesn't require a huge commitment. It actually only requires one hour of time per year to do some type of firewise related work on your property. So that could be clearing out your gutters or removing invasive vegetation or cleaning up fuels or things like that. And usually with these firewise communities, uh, there will be like an educational event or a workshop or something like that uh, once per year. So it's not a huge commitment, but you can learn a lot and um, get to know your community and also look for vulnerabilities in your community. And the Oregon Department of Forestry serves as kind of an advisor to this group. So if you're interested, again, we would love to have you uh, get involved. And we have information about all these programs at our table in the other building uh, that you can visit after these presentations. So thanks for your time. I appreciate it. And I will now turn it over to Tyler Nice to talk about wildfire mitigation measures. Hello, my name is Tyler Nice. I'm the electric division manager at eWeb. And uh, really just tonight, I want to talk to you about the, the, uh, what, what EWIB's doing in regards to wildfire mitigation as it relates to the power system. Wildfire season's here. Oh, sorry, I know some, some noises here. Uh, wildfire season is, is here and upon us, and wildfires are top of mind, I know, for everyone here in the community and in this room, but also EWIB staff. Uh, this year, uh, what I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about is, is the things we're doing uh, right now as part of our normal procedures that limit the risk of wildfire. Also want to discuss with you the things that we've already put in place that are very specific to wildfire mitigation and then what we're planning through this year and beyond on our full, full wildfire mitigation plan. So starting back on the right now, um, you know, the main risk of wildfire uh, associated with power lines is contact to trees. We have a uh, very robust tree management, uh, vegetation management program, and we do have some folks here from the, our foresters uh, that can answer all your questions, and they have some materials and how to reach them and everything. We trim about 300 miles a year, line miles a year, in our system, and that's an ongoing basis that we wrap around the system, kind of like cleaning the, or uh, painting the Golden Gate Bridge that we chop up over the course of time. Uh, and that, that, that basically pulls the trees away from the lines. The second thing we do, uh, and there are compliance requirements associated with that, other thing we do is inspections and maintenance on the equipment itself. So that could be looking at rotten poles, rotten cross arms, or, or equipment, because that's the other big risk of, uh, of fire in power lines is equipment failure. So we inspect those, and that's an annual piece of work as well. The other thing that, that's worth mentioning in our normal processes is how we respond to events. So when there's an emergency situation uh, associated with one, any of our equipment, a lot of times we'll get a report. One you might know, hear about is like a car hit a pole and, and we'll de-energize that through dispatch when alerted by partner agency or, or an outage report. And, and that's the same with wildfire. Right now and in, in part of our normal procedure, if, if there's a risk out there that we know about and that we're told for the, like I said, reports, what, that, that's another method to limit it. Now looking at what we've done this year and what we've done recently and, and going forward, 
that are wildfire specific. One is what we do in a red flag event. So when red flag events come, that triggers us to make changes in our, our system such that it trips off quicker, more sensitive, and, uh, and it also requires us to do some additional patrol before we turn it on. One of the things as a step is calling our uh, 911 supervisory number to, to ensure there's no active events or access issues in the area. Um, when, we, when we do that, we'll then patrol the line and our techs will get a visual uh, safety check basically, and then we'll only re-energize when it's safe to do so. It's worth noting in that that when we have those red flag events, that means that the lines, since they're more sensitive, tr might trip off more often than we're used to in a, in a wind event or, or when those triggers happen. Um, and then it, it may take us a little bit longer to patrol incrementally, so I, I hope you'd understand that. Uh, the, the other part is back to the tree management, the, the tree trimming. We, we do additional focused uh, trimming on what we call our high fire risk circuits, and that's about 250 additional miles per year. We do that on an annual basis. That includes all of upriver, the transmission and distribution, also some circuits in South Eugene mainly that, that we've identified. And that, that we completed that plan uh, last month, a uh, little bit ago, and, uh, and we'll do that annually as well. Now onto the things that, that we'll be doing you know, throughout this year is we, we are going to be, we are in the process of creating a distinct wildfire management plan, and that's a requirement with the state as well that, that will get adopted by the board and submitted. And that, that encompasses some more aspects of looking at things like construction standards that are a little more long-term, more possibly more monitoring will be one of the things we evaluate that could be weather stations or other, other methods in uh, high-risk areas. The other one is what we do during red flags that might trigger some other tools in our tool bag as far as how we treat the system, how we respond, um, and also some of the vegetation pieces as well will be evaluated. So that'll be ongoing through the year and as we improve things and enhance the system we will um, you know, be communicating that out because that is a big component of this is our communication plan that our communication folks have put together and so as we're going through this year, you may see, you know, educational things on, on any of our communication avenues, also uh, directing you to the right resources um, for weather events and also for uh, resources in there. Um, and so as we go through the year, look out for that. We'll also be, uh, you know, as, as we get done with that plan, communicating out the changes. So really appreciate the time tonight and the interest. But with that, I'll hand it over to Frank for the next portion. Thank you, Tyler. I would like to take a moment to thank Mackenzie Fire and Rescue and specifically Chief Darren. Uh, thanks for your, your flexibility. We didn't know what the COVID situation was going to be or the weather situation, and so uh, we had some contingency plans thanks to you. I guess you're into planning. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to also offer the board an opportunity to make a few comments before we get to questions and answers. Uh, and so if you'd like to offer any color commentary, um, I will. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I just want to apologize for being late. There was an accident on the freeway, um, so that's why we are here a little bit late. Um, I just want to thank the staff for all your presentations um, and also for everybody for coming out tonight. I know that some of you are our customers and some of you are probably, you just live in the area and you're impacted by eWeb's um, reach that we have out here. So I appreciate everybody showing up and I look forward to hearing the question and answers. And I'm going to offer if any of the other commissioners want to say anything. Well, thank you. Um, my name's John Brown, and I've been around for a little while, and I really want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Um, I know that you don't get to vote for us, and maybe that's good for us, and maybe good for you. I don't know. Uh, but I do want to remind you that every one of us can take a phone call or an email. And um, Mindy is our, uh, she, we all have two wards in Eugene. There's eight wards but for city council wards, but she's kind of the area rep for everything, and I was in that position before, so all of us are open for questions, comments, or criticism, or whatever. If you have something you want to communicate to us, please do, because even though you don't get to vote for us, we listen, and that's why we're here. And so if you have issues, or if you have questions, comments, compliments, or anything else, don't hesitate, don't be shy 
tell us what you think because we can only do what we hear and so we have to be able to communicate with you so thank you very much for attending and please if you have something you need to say or you want to say do it because we're open to listen thank you thank you um, I'm John ugh, I'm, I'm John Borofsky I'm one of the newer uh, commissioners uh, Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we really do value all of our customers, uh, whether we, you can vote for us or not, like John said. Um, and I think all of us have a really strong feeling for the Mackenzie Valley and everything that, that you guys offer up here and the things that we offer to you as well. So we hope to continue on with the partnership that's been going on for over 90 years. Hello, my name is Matt McCray. I'm new to the board this year as of January and just likewise want to say thanks for carving out the time to be here and thanks to Chief Busich and your team for hosting us. Hi, and I'm, this is really awkward. Um, sorry, I'm a big proponent of vaccines, but I have a family member who can't get vaccinated, so I wear this in solidarity with him. Uh, so, Sonia Carlson, I'm an uh, eWeb commissioner. I've been on the board for four years um, in my second term. Thank you very, very much for having us out here tonight. And I can't, I have to pause and recognize that the people up here, the McKinsey Fire Group, help save so many lives and, and protect so many homes up here over this last fall. I just can't help but but think about that and recognize and say thank you very much for everything that you do every day to protect us and, and opening up your doors to helping, you know, helping us come up here and, and work with you to help restore the area here. Everything that you do every day, just thank you very much for everything that you've done. So, thank you. So if you really have a passionate complaint, the address is commissioners at eweb.org, uh, just so you know. Um, we would like to open up the floor now for uh, public comments and questions. We did have somebody in the queue who had a young child and they needed to go, and I think that's Anna. So is the process, Joe, to have them step up to the microphone? And while she's coming up, um, you can direct, I mean, the, the commissioners are here to listen and comment as necessary. Please feel free to comment or, or question us on any subject. We gave you a little bit of an overview from wildfires to canals to pricing, um, but feel free to comment on anything of your choosing. Thank you, Anna. I think you've got the floor. All right. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Anna, and uh, uh, we are the recipients uh, of the eWeb house that has to be moved. Um, that's my beloved husband and my super glorious child, about to be seven. Uh, we lost our home in the fire uh, and both our businesses. My husband is an artist and, and all his paintings burned, everything was lost. Uh, and my, I make women's clothing and my studio was in Blue River and that is also lost. Um, all the patterns, all fabric, everything. So uh, the ability to get this home and move it to our property is an incredible boon for us because um, we thought that we were going to have to live in a bus for three years while we slowly cobble together something. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you um, for allowing us to move forward so much quicker and have a normal life so much faster. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to give you a little background and go ahead and come on up, just um, eWeb bought some property um, that was um, subject to some some threats because of, of um, its its nearity to one of the canals that we were having some issues with and so we actually bought the property we didn't necessarily need the house so we donated the house and through a number of different organizations it looks like it went to a good cause so we were happy to do that go ahead yeah go ahead and come on up Okay, so the, the National Weather Service, sorry Tyler, I'm taking, uh, um, he, he's a welfare guy. Okay. 
So there were two questions that she, she asked there. Uh, the first one is, what is a red flag event? And the other one is, why didn't we turn off power um, given the, that there was warning of winds? Um, the, the first answer is a red flag event is issued, or a red flag warning is issued by the National Weather Service. And it usually occurs when a forecast says that there's very low humidity, um, very hot temperatures, and very dry, or very um, high winds. And so that combination will um, drive the National Weather Service to issue red flag warnings, and they're usually very specific to certain areas, so they're locational as well. As far as uh, turning off power, um, some utilities uh, do have programs for what are called preventative shutoffs. Uh, others do not. Um, in the case uh, that you're referring to, I believe at Blue River, um, we did have our lines that they were de-energized at the time that the fire broke out. Um, that was actually a result of our safety equipment and they operated like they should have at the time. And so um, that occurred at I think about 5.30 in the evening and reports um, from, from reports that we heard the fire uh, was allegedly started about 8 o'clock in the evening. So in that particular area, and then there were a few other areas around the Mackenzie Valley and in the South Hills of Eugene where we did have lines de-energized because of how we have the safety equipment set up. So in that particular location at that time, uh, the eWeb lines were de-energized. There were, yeah, she, um, so her question, I'm just repeating so everybody can hear. Uh, there was another power up company up in that area. There's actually three different utilities that have equipment in this area. Um, Bonneville Power Administration is one. They have transmission lines. EWEB is another, and Lane Electric Cooperative is the third. And there are different territories and different um, equipment in, in, in that area at the time. So um, I'm assuming you're asking because you're curious about the fire and the investigation associated with the fire. So. Um, I will tell you that when it comes to the fire investigation, um, we are still cooperating. The, the investigation is being done by the federal government, so it's the Department of Forestry in combination with the um, U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice. Uh, we are cooperating. Uh, they have not issued a cause report yet, and so um, until we get that cause report, uh, we won't have uh, further details on the specific cause as determined by the report. So um, until that comes out, we continue to cooperate. It's, we're getting regular requests for certain information and certain data, of which we've continued to cooperate, as, as I'm assuming the other utilities are as well. Okay, so like an earthquake also a red flag event? No, an earthquake is, is not a red flag event. So. Sorry, I feel like I, I don't... How'd I do? All right. <laughs> We'd be open to other comments or questions as well. How far up does um, eWeb provide power? My understanding the Holiday Inn fire is under control of Lane Electric. Am I wrong? Yeah, the, we, we supplied distribution power, you know, home, homes and residences up to just before Ben and K. Doris Park right. there at Thompson Lane, and that's where our service territory ends. We have transmission lines that go all the way up to the Carmen power plant, yeah. <clears throat> but as far as past that, that point, we don't supply power to any of the residences up there. Then why is eWeb being sued? The fire. I, what was the question? Why is eWeb getting sued then? <laughs> so, so I, what, what happens in a lot of these cases, and it happened in California with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, it happened with Pacific Core, it's happening with eWeb, is almost immediately after the fire, we were notified by the federal government that they were going to investigate the cause, which is understandable. Uh, immediately after that, we probably got 70 or more different tort claims notices that we were going to be sued. Uh, these were by attorneys everywhere from San Diego to Chicago. 
Uh, and so um, I think because of the situation and the fact that uh, wildfires and utilities are vulnerable to suits, um, you, get, you get lawsuits. And so um, presently we know of, of at least one that is um, a suit of both eWeb and Lane Electric. And so that's, that's an active suit that has been filed. Okay. Second thing, how come eWeb's so involved with Lane or with uh, McKinsey Trust? You're, you're supposed to be a power provider. It sounds to me like you do a lot of side projects involved with this McKinsey Trust. So um, eWeb has a long history in the McKinsey Valley, and only part of that is electric. Um, we have generation facilities, and our main interest in working with McKinsey River Trust, um, which I'm assuming the, the, the group that you referenced, uh, is because of our interest in the McKinsey River from a water quality perspective. Uh, the McKinsey River is the, uh, and our only drinking water source for the citizens of Eugene, and so we continue to think it's important to invest in water quality uh, and the watershed. So uh, we uh, partner with people like Pure Water Partners, McKinsey River Trust, um, a number of other um, uh, groups that care about water quality in the McKinsey Valley. And so it's a combination of one, we have a presence here because of our generation sites and our, our electric supply, but also we're very interested in maintaining water quality for the, the people of Eugene that we serve. Yes as we all are there's no question mm -hmm. it just seems to me you're uh, you're involved in a lot more than just generation instead of focusing on the generation my personal opinion okay and finally how many of the commissioners are from this area thank you so god okay i'm just going to stand back here uh yeah the, the way that it works for city voting it for the eWeb races, we actually have to be in one of the, e the wards, the city of Eugene wards. So like I represent wards six and seven. Um, Mindy is the at-large commissioner, which represents the entire area, but we, don't, we can't live up here because you actually have to live in one of the wards. And that was how the, the charter was set up initially. So if we want to run for office, we have to live in one of those wards. Um, I did want to note, too, that a lot of the commissioners, we actually ask for the staff to partner with a number of other organizations so that we can get more bang for our buck, right? We want to make sure that we're spending the dollars wisely, and you can go a lot further if you don't go alone. So working with the other organizations like the McKenzie River Trust and others that were listed this evening, they can actually do a lot more and benefit the community more if they work with these other organizations. So we actually look for that when they come and ask us for funding hey, did you try to get this done with others? So that's part of the reason that you know, they do work with others. My name is Richard Tracy. Uh, I live about three blocks up the river here. I got a couple of questions. Um, when the water was drained from the canal, or shortly before about that time, there was something built down here about a mile. What is that? It's eWeb's something. I don't know what it is. Holden Creek substation on the on the north side of the highway. Yes. Yeah. So that was a substation. Tyler could talk a little bit more about the intent of that substation. If you're is curious. it in operation? Yes, it's currently in operation. Uh, it it basically is an intersection point on the line from Thurston substation down in Springfield up to the Carmen facility. Oh. And so right there is where we tapped into the uh, BPA line. So it doesn't have anything to do with this power plant. The, the power from the power plant, if it should generate again, will go into that, yes. And then the feeders that, that supply the power uh, for this upriver feeder comes out of that as well. So if you don't use this power plant anymore, you still use that? Still will use that, that yeah. Okay. And it, it's doing its job, per se, right now. <clears throat> My other question is about water rights. Um, since the canal is drained, I don't have irrigation for my crops, whatever. And I haven't since it's been drained. Prior to it being drained, I and others used to get our water from the water rights off the bottom of the canal. Four or five years ago, eWeb decided they wanted to give us our water off the top of the canal. 
Now the canal is down. There's still about six, seven feet of water in it, but I don't have any water anymore. Is, is it being considered to give us water off the bottom of the canal, even if it's just a storm drainage? I'm talking about Johnson Creek drainage. I don't know about the others. Yeah, so um, there are uh, a, a total of, I think, about 25 um, different properties that were relying on the Lieber Canal for water prior to our outage. And very few of them are set up to be able to continue to draw water with a, a low canal level, whether it's because of the um, elevation of the inlet, as, as you're describing, the, the, the change that was made um, about 10 years ago, lowering the inlet to, to your water supply. Um, that's a, a situation that um, I would say about 90% of the water users along the canal are challenged by currently. Um, and when uh, Lisa was talking about the you know, triple bottom line evaluation um, that's underway, those are the types of considerations that are, you know, elevating where um, the, the impact to property owners uh, who have historically relied on the canal as the source of their water is one of the significant impacts um, that have occurred. And so um, whether eWeb returns to generation or not, um, th those irrigation considerations could factor into future canal modifications because you're actually correct. Uh, Mr. Tracy, that the um, stormwater conveyance that the canal would continue to provide may still um, uh, provide a source for irrigators like yourself, but th there would be some investments that need to be made, as, as you have uh, acknowledged, in order to make that feasible. So th that's some of the factors that we're um, taking into consideration as we're looking at these future paths forward, whether it's a return to service or a stormwater conveyance? Well, all I know is if I stand on the canal and I look where the water feeds to my property, there's still six to eight feet of water in the bottom, and that drain was right in the bottom. It's still right. there. It's plugged up. Right. So there was yeah. always been water over the top of that drain. I, I understood that eWeb changed it around because it kept plugging up with debris and and that's a lot of manpower, man hours to get out there and unplug it. And there yep. was some concern about erosion too. Yeah, there was a yeah, combination of factors. It's interesting that we made that change um, for maintenance and for dam safety reasons um, to, to make it a safer water withdrawal. And, and, and you're correct, in this uh, drawn down water state, it is now impossible to gravity flow water out of the canal any longer. Not where I am, because I can I can see there's six feet of water, right. and I'm yep. way lower than where the bottom of the canal is. So. Right, without a canal modification, you're correct. Yep, that's it is a frustrating situation. Yeah, I was wondering where does this canal end? Doesn't it end at uh, Partridge? And then it continues on. I heard something about the canal still ran through Partridge. Yeah, there's, there's two canals up here. There's the Lieber Canal. That's uh, the one that's currently out of service. Um, the one uh, that you're referring to at, at Partridge Lane, that's the intake or near the intake to the Walterville Canal. So there's two separate p canals that run parallel to the Mackenzie River and two mm. powerhouses. The one that's out of service right now is Lieber. Oh, yeah, Lieber Canal terminates right down here at the power plant. Lieber Canal, the one that's out of service, uh, terminates right down here at the, at the Lieber power plant, just down the highway from us. And then there's, uh, I don't know, five, six miles in between until the Walterville Canal intake starts. The other thing that might be confusing for you right now is the Walterville Canal is currently drawn down for annual maintenance outage. That occurs every June 
for two to three weeks. And so um, those of you who might have been driving up river, you would see two canals without water in them. One of them usually has water. That's the Walterville Canal. That's the one um, westmost um, from here. I guess for Lisa on the canal here, um, you know, does eWeb consider the fish hatchery or do they consider the power source down here and also the water, the irrigation for the farmers? I mean, this is filtering the water right into a clean river. That's what keeps your river clean. And, you know, I grew up here, I went to Leeburg. They used to have tours up here, the salmon coming up that and everything else, that's an endangered species. You know, we, we need to fix that canal and get it going again and use it for overflow whatever because just like when you got storms that rivers eroding the banks and you got nowhere to deal with it right there so i just wondering if you guys realize that and what's going on when i get through here i'm going to go help sort salmon at the, at the dam this evening but if i were king yeah it takes 70 cfs in the canal just to run because uh, of salmon hatchery for the ladder. There's no water coming down the ladder, the fish are coming back and they don't know where to go so they're going up to the dam, it's a mess. But the, the big federal government tells us we can't do anything in that canal. We can't even put enough water for the salmon hatchery. And the, the fish that are coming into the salmon hatchery are not native, they're hatchery fish and so the passion isn't there for that, I get it. I get the everything else but we, they can't let us put any water in that canal until we address the, the integrity of the canal walls, and it, the federal government controls us on this FERC. Yeah, Army Corps of Engineers is supposed to run it, and um, they're they're supposed to provide it. I mean, the same thing. I get that, and uh, I, I, Lisa's really good at, at, at this. She, she knows that. So, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, I'll give you just a little bit of background on the. Um the Mackenzie River hatchery, so the salmon hatchery that um, has historically pulled water off of the Lieber Canal. Um, we understand the situation that they've been in for the last many years and it has been obviously very problematic. Um, I did want to note that we have worked very closely with the hatchery to see what, if any, feasible options we might have to, to get them any additional water. Unfortunately, given uh, what we've been ordered to do by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the the elevation that we're required to keep the canal, we're, we're, there's next to nothing that we can do for the hatchery to pull water from the intake that they currently have off of the Lieberg Canal. One of the things that I do want to note is that the, the Mackenzie Hatchery does, they do have a water right and it's for the Mackenzie River. And we have, um, through a cooperative agreement, allowed them to take water, um, their Mackenzie River water right out of the Lieberg Canal, as we've done for, for lots of folks. Um, the slight difference with the hatchery, and I hope this is okay to say, is but we, we've been, we have recognized um, that the hatchery's reliance on the canal as their primary and only source of water was a big risk. And so we've been, um, I think the most, the longest, the history was maybe in 1992, we started talking with them about um, the risk to their hatchery for that. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's problematic for, um, and very expensive for them to get an, an alternate water source, so they never um, did go through that. Um, the hatchery is uh, operated, it's funded by the Corps of Engineers and operated by the state. Um, so, point being, we understand the situation that they're in, and I understand that it's, it's very frustrating, but we have been, I mean, we talk with them near constantly around what their situation is and if there's any feasible options that we can do to provide them with water. I, I can uh, I can only I can speak for what we've done at a staff level. I, I can tell you most of our work with the federal government um, 
is not related to specifically lobbying for a, for a fish facility. Um, most of it has been um, working with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to uh, try to find ways to have some flexibility to get the canal back in service and understanding what those conditions are. Um, and, and staff has been working with them regularly. It, we, we have to ask for permission to do anything on, on the canal. Um, and it goes through a, a pretty arduous process. But we are not lobbying presently um, for funds for that purpose. Um, we are lobbying in general, I'll, I'll say, for funds having to do with infrastructure. There's been a lot of talk right lately about infrastructure funds. Um, those have to do with resiliency. They have to do with electricity and water systems. And um, we have been lobbying both at the state level and the federal level for funds for those types of purposes. Um, also recognizing that infrastructure takes lots of forms, that would also potentially include things like hatcheries and other things. So uh, it's been a little bit generic, but uh, we have lobbied for infrastructure funds in general, but not specific for that purpose. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I'm good. I would just say we, we agree absolutely that infrastructure is incredibly important to us. Um, the, the water side, when I say water side, so when you refer to water side, we, we think about water from a drinking water perspective, a McKinsey perspective, and also from a water management perspective for generations. So, and and to, be, to be honest, what ties this whole community together and eWeb's presence here is water. I mean, that's, that's where it, it begins. It goes back to 1911, I think, it, when, when we first, uh, and I think we built one of the plants up here in 1912 or 13. I don't remember that myself, but um, it's, been, it's been part of our presence. So we do consider water and infrastructure incredibly important to what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, the, the canal was constructed in 1928. Yeah, the, the board has a couple of things to contemplate uh, relative to that, relative to the canal. Some of those are near term and some of them are longer term. Uh, the license we have to operate both Walterville and Lieberg expires in 2040. Um, so we're about halfway through that license that, that we got in the early 2000s. Um, in the near term, there's a number of investment decisions that um, staff has to bring to the board around the degree to which we return that, that canal to full production or whether it's just for water management. There's a little bit different of difference in cost between those two. Um, as well as what kind of return on investment we would get for the power that it produces. Um, and so if you're going to invest an extra amount of money, you have to make sure that the, that the power can, can return that, that part of the investment. What complicates that is there are certain requirements under our federal license that we are evaluating presently, and we're going to bring this information to the board in August, both uh, related to water rights and also related to our, our FERC license, there's a number of legal obligations we have under that. And we don't know if we can actually say, oh, we're not interested in producing power going forward. So these are things we have to investigate. And then we'll bring some, some, um, some requests to the board and, and seek the board's feedback on some of these issues like you're, you're bringing up and others are bringing up. Um, and then in the longer term, it probably won't be this board but um, probably in the late 2020s, then uh, a board will have to decide whether they're going to pursue a relicensing of the two sites. Um, that, of course, occurs in 2040, but the last license took us 16 years to get? Three days, two months, six hours? I, um, 
So in about 2030, uh, an eWeb board will have to decide, do we relicense the facility or potentially do we decommission it and return it to its natural state? And that's another option potentially. Yes? So are you talking about the end of the license? So. Well, right now, the, uh, we're working with FERC. There will be requirements to make it safe for water management. So this is to manage side streams. That's at a minimum. Um, and they, they may require other things relative to power production. In the long term, typically, it takes, it, it takes a decade or longer to decommission a, a site, a uh, generation site, like we'd be talking about in 2040 or beyond. It, take, it takes a long time. They're, they don't tend to be in a hurry. Um, so you asked specifically as a board, are, are, what are we considering? I can't speak for the board, but I can speak for myself and say that I feel very strongly about this issue and, and trying to make sure that the, this canal can keep doing what it's been doing for the last 100 years. Um, whether that will be possible or not, I don't know at this point because we have to get more information. But I can just speak for myself that I know the impact that the, the water, the power, the fish, all of that has not only on this community but the whole regional community as a whole. So just know for myself personally, I do take it very seriously and I will consider all options and, and try and do it as best I can. There we are. Uh, my name is Eric Clark, and I'm a, a new resident on Greenwood Avenue as of last year with my wife and uh, children. Um, we love it here. Um, and I just wanted to make two comments on the Lieber Canal, um, one on the social aspect and another on the economic. On the social side, I'm hoping that the staff will consider the use of the canal path as a running recreational park-like um, space and continue to provide sort of end-to-end -end traversal um, from the power plant to the dam. Um, my children in particular run that path regularly. We see many other residents making good use of the canal side path, and so it's, I would suggest, ask, request that that be considered in evaluation of plans for the canal. Um, and then the second economically, um, we, you mentioned the possibility of having to decommission. One of the things I would uh, again, suggest, ask, recommend, is uh, considering and estimating those decommissioning costs when making the economic decision about the future of the canal. It would be very unfortunate to make a decision without those costs being estimated or modeled to turn the canal into a stormwater runoff and then find out that the dam has to be removed because you have to restore it to a natural state and suddenly the cost of that make the cost of restoring the dam, restoring the canal to service look reasonable. Um, and so I, you know, it's obviously up to you to make those estimates, but I'd ask that you keep in mind that decommissioning the canal will likely lead to follow on costs to decommission the dam and that those costs may be substantially higher than the cost of restoring the canal to service. Thank you. No, it cost us more to service the people up here than oh. it does the people in Eugene. Yeah, but we give you all the water, the power, anyway. Yeah. It's coming from up here. Yeah. Yes. And then also, um, about the canal and seeing all that, I went and looked at it, I thought I'd kill myself, no. But you know, you, it's stagnant water, that causes insects and everything, you know. Kind of disgusting. I don't know. 
What do you do with your stagnant water? I mean, some people do live right next to one, you know, I don't know. Doesn't that cause mosquitoes? And I'll um, make a comment, and I don't know, Mark, if you had anything you wanted to add. Um, we recognize that's an issue. I mean, the, there's been flowing water in that canal for nearly 90 years, up until the last few years, right? So it is a big change. Um, and I, we recognize that there have been significant impacts to the local community who live up here. Um, unfortunately, given uh, what we're required to do under um, our, our license from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, we we don't have options for, say, flushing the canal or doing that sort of thing to kind of try to, to, to scour it out. We can't raise the water elevation in there at this point because of the concerns over um, the canal embankment and the safety um, issues related to that. So recognize that it, that it is um, it's different up here the last few years than it has been. And there are there is stagnant water in the canal, and um, I do have a lot of compassion for all of you who live on the canal and, and have experienced that. And unfortunately, we're, we're pretty limited in our options in the short term on, on how to address that. Okay. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to uh, um, add that in response to those observations that we've had from neighbors, um, our water quality staff are um, starting to monitor the canal for the presence of any, any um, water quality hazards. And so that's something we want to understand better so that we can take that into account in terms of how we ultimately end up managing the canal, whether it's in the stormwater uh, conveyance for a, a long period of time. We need to understand those impacts. So definitely appreciate the, um, the information. And then just one comment to, to your uh, comments around decommissioning. You're right, uh, decommissioning scenarios can range, um, I mean, all across the board, and we, we recognize that. There's a, there's a pretty um, extensive process to go through for decommissioning, and it, it involves partnering with other regulatory agencies and stakeholders. So um, we can make some guesses as to what decommissioning might look like, but until you actually go through the, that negotiation process, if you will, um, we don't have certainty over that. So, but, you, but you're right, they can, they can range far and wide, and that can change the, the economics of the equation. Hi, I'm Dana Burwa. I'm a lifelong resident of uh, Mackenzie Valley here. I have a commercial blueberry farm that the canal intersects, goes right through the middle of. Uh, I first want to thank um, a lot of people here for coming out, especially the board for bringing the meetings out here in Frank. Um, I really appreciate that. It makes a big difference. Um, I also want to give kudos to Mark. He uh, worked with the local commercial farmers here and made sure we got water. We got water about two weeks before the plants all died, so we made it just in time. Um, so he did, Mark did above and beyond getting the FERC uh, license amended for us. Um, also, I work with the fire department and uh, Carl and um, has done a wonderful job on doing the cleanup and working with the watershed councils and the uh, Mackenzie River Trust to make that happen. So I want to thank you for that. <coughs> the questions I have um, are about, number one, the canal, obviously. Uh, back in, I think it was January, the staff gave a board report, uh, a report to the board about the cost of decommissioning versus um, keeping it or rebuilding it and making it whole again. And um, at the time, we didn't get a lot of information about what all those numbers were. We just got the numbers. But in the cost analysis, uh, I know there had to be analysis of the price per megawatt in there. And I'd like to ask the staff, at what price per megawatt does it become feasible to open that canal back up and run it? Um, we know that we're not producing a lot more power plants and electric cars are going to eat up a lot more. So I think in the future, we're going to see the cost analysis swing more towards opening it back up, hopefully. But without knowing the actual numbers and how you're getting those numbers, we can't really make that decision. So we'd like to see that if we could, if there's a... Uh, place on a website that we could look at those and how the staff made those recommendations, that would be great. <coughs> the other 
Second part of that is the 14% increase for the local residents. We'd really like to see how that, the numbers got figured into that. And are, is the local residents being charged for the maintenance of the canals and the maintenance of the people up here? Or is that spread among the whole department as a whole, the city of Eugene? Does the cost uh, that eWeb pays the city of Eugene, I know several million dollars a year, is that only for the Eugene residents that benefit from that, or is that spread to us also? Can any of the staff answer that when you made the analysis? Frank would have to take the question on the cost of service. <laughs> I'll just test, okay, good. Um, so you asked a couple of questions. The first one I thought had to do with the economic analysis of the canal. Did you right. want any feedback on that one, or did you? Yeah, know if you that? know, there's got to be a breakover point where it becomes becomes economically feasible to to restart the canal and fix it. Right. And that's probably tied to a cost of megawatt price right. of power. Obviously, if it goes up to two or three hundred dollars a megawatt, I'm sure you'd probably open that back up again. Sure, sure, absolutely. So where does so, that breakover start? So there were, um, the analysis that we did was in, in two different levels. The first level was to just do the minimum required that we had to do to make the canal safe for water management. That's storm runoff managing side streams and that. Um, which means we didn't have to do the entire canal. Um, only those locations that were um, appropriate for water management. And, and some of our initial estimates were ranging from $20 million to $35 million to do that, just for water management. If we wanted to actually generate electricity, we would have to extend those repairs further along the canal. We would basically have to rebuild the entire canal. That's probably uh, another 20 to 35 million, so it's probably doubling, doubling that uh, from our initial estimates. So we're looking at, I'll just round that to a $30 million cost, and then you have to go, how long does it take you to recover that in megawatt hours sold or kilowatt hours sold? Um, even using some, some pretty aggressive, favorable forecasts, the return on that was somewhere in the $12 million range. And so we would have to see prices that would quadruple, probably, in order to recover the investment just on the power piece of that. Right now, um, our melded cost is around four cents a kilowatt. So it would have to be, you'd have to see market prices in the probably 16 or 20 uh, per megawatt. So you can imagine, if, if we're seeing those kinds of prices in the market, you can also imagine what it's going to do to the rest of the pressure on our pricing. So um, the, the return on that um, is going to be a challenge for us, honestly. I'll, uh, you know, we'll have to work with the board uh, when we get uh, more information specifically on where those costs land. And can, um, there, there's a number of things changing in the power markets, uh, carbon pricing. Um, this is a carbon-free resource, which should have more value to it. Um, it is run of the river and not dispatchable. It just runs all the time, which doesn't make it quite as valuable as if we could turn it on and off um, um, frequently. So um, all those will be considered, but we'd probably at least need to see a three to four times increase in the, in the cost um, on the market. Okay, and the second part of the question was a 14% increase. What's included in that? What is being charged to the residents up here that is not being charged to the residents in town and vice versa? Sure. So um, in general, things like uh, generation, so when we talk about canal costs and we talk about water management and those kinds of things, uh, anything that, that has to do with producing electricity is spread across the entire customer base. There's, there's no division, and that typically comes out in an energy charge, and that's the same whether you're in town, upriver, or, or anywhere else. Where we started to see some of the differences in cost, um, it's, it's probably understandable. Um, one of those was um, the makeup of the environment out here is more woodsy, more tree-like, so you saw um, a higher allocation for tree trimming costs, for example, and then transportation and inventory costs. Um, every time we make a service call up into this area, it adds 30 to 60 miles round trip. 
Uh, and so there were, or you could store inventory out here, which drives that cost. So those were probably the major differences. All of the, the administrative costs, all of the sort of standard um, costs for power production uh, were, were spread across the entire customer base. So, um, and, and that, to, to the point earlier, what it led to was um, those costs that we could contribute. And th there's, there's hundreds of accounts that we capture these costs in, so there's, right. it's pretty complicated. But um, when you go through that, um, the cost recovery for this was 14% was under, under what it should. So um, that, that was the end result. And how we address that or if we address that is coming later. The money you pay the city of Eugene for police and fire and right away, is that spread throughout the whole thing or is that just to the Eugene residents? So the, we, we pay what's called a contribution in lieu of taxes. Um, that's, that's a flat charge. Um, it, it's a charge, it's not a flat charge. It's a charge that we pay the city of Eugene. Um, it is based on consumption and it is spread across our entire customer base. Um, that's the way that they allocate their cost and so we have to allocate that the same way. Um, the only exception to that is there's a, a, a fixed charge that we we pay the city of Eugene for our wholesale business that we sell outside of, of the territory to other utilities. But that cost is um, peanut buttered across our entire customer base um, because that's how the cost is um, presented to us. The city of Eugene does not distinguish is what, is what I'm saying. Okay. Well, Mr. Larson, thank you for coming out and bringing your, your board out. I really want to thank Carl and Nancy for the fine work they've been doing up here and also Mark for really working with the commercial farmers up here to make us stay whole. So, and thanks to John Brown and the rest of the board for really working with the river. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I did want to make sure that we clarified that the, the COSA is an analysis. It's a cost of service analysis. So it is a, a look at how much it costs to provide the services, but only the services that you receive up here. Not, not other services that you don't receive. So when you mention that you know, we don't provide water up here, we don't pr that's not part of the cost of service analysis because it's not a service we provide to you up here. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Also, it's not something that we've actually voted to support yet. Last year, the, the board looked at the cost of service analysis, analysis, analysis. It was brought before the board, and we decided to vote against implementing it against implementing a price increase at that point. So it's something that we're looking at, how much it costs to service, and not just in this area, but in other areas too. There's, there's higher costs to, um, to service other areas within the Eugene area, and we've talked about what it looks like in Eugene, upriver, in other areas. There's a different rate that, uh, for the water that we provide to Vanita and the water that we provide um, to the River Road area and the services that we provide to those areas. So it, part of the process is to look at across the board the different regions that we service as a utility to make sure that every region is, get, is, is paying their fair share. Now again, last year the board looked at that. Um, it was the first time that we had looked at this region and we said, you know, we're not, we're not going to do that right now. We're not going to change the rates. So it's something that we're continuing to look at. It's not something that we have implemented already. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear to you all. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom Hoyt. I have the privilege of serving as the president of the McKinsey River Discovery Center. Tonight we have two of our board members here, Ken Engelman and Steve Maley. Uh, we are partners on the McKinsey River. And I want to share with you uh, one of the uh, facts that came out of this fire. We, owned, we possess for the next 99 years 46 acres and four, six historical buildings at the old McKinsey Fish Hatchery site. And our plans are to build a world-class interpretive center there. To date, we've raised over $2 million for that purpose. When the fire came through, it severely burned most of our forest, including the uh, water pipes that brought water from Hatchery Creek down into the old pond that is behind the buildings. Now, 
that hatchery was decommissioned in 1957. It was built in the 1920s. At that time, over 100 years ago, electricity was generated by a water wheel. That we have a replica of it there now. You can see it. We just got a grant from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to restore the water supply from Hatchery Creek down to the pond and to clean out the pond and put in fishing platforms. So within a year, we will have families fly fishing and fishing in our pond, catching hatchery trout. But that pond will be watered by a new water line that will be paid by this grant. And we have elected to put in a third water line a, right down the middle, which we hope in the future will be the water supply for the water wheel demonstrating how we used to generate electricity here 100 years ago. So we want you to know that we're partners and we really look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Will Rutherford and uh, I live up up the river here just a ways. I attend most of the uh, commissioner's meetings. Uh, in fact, John Brown's the only surviving commissioner or general manager or many of the staff uh, that I've been working or watching and working with. And we started with our McKinsey Clearwater Coalition um, uh, back in uh, 2010. It was a matter of trust community trust and what eWeb was doing. And I gotta say, eWeb has reclaimed a lot of that trust. And I thank you for bringing the meeting here tonight. I thank you for putting the brochure together to let us know what all is going on in our valley that you are concerned with. And, uh, and I thank you uh, for um, the presentations that you've made. Uh, as you know, because several of you have heard me voice it, I have a problem with the cost of service analysis. I'm relieved to know, if I understand correctly, that that probably will not materialize in any rate structure change for 2022. Is that correct? So, Will, uh, I think just make sure everybody understood the question. You were asking about whether the cost of service analysis materialize for 2022. Um, we, we have a number of different pricing issues to talk to the board about this fall. That'll be one of them. Um, it is, um, when we look at cost of service, uh, there's a number of issues relative to re recouping fixed char charges versus variable charges. And we do plan on presenting some information to the board this fall. Um, you know, when we, pr we presented it before, and, and Commissioner Carlson was correct, they, they chose uh, not to uh, pursue or implement a change. Um, there were probably a number of reasons for that. Um, as a, by the way, when you say surviving general manager, it makes me a little nervous. Um, <laughs> but uh, just, uh, so, um, the, the way that we have to look at presentations to the board is to look at the integrity of the process of which we use to present something. Um, nobody likes to go to a board and say something's out of whack and we'd, we'd like to raise a rate. Um, I have to look at that and go, would I have made a recommendation to the board if it would have showed just the opposite? If it would have showed a 10% reduction and you were overpaying, I don't think anybody here would have a problem with the COSA. <laughs> it would be, hey, why aren't we getting a 10% reduction? So we have to look at the integrity of that. The board has to decide then looking forward, and, and it's going to be a little different this year. We're going to present a three-year um, forecast for rates, not just for all rates on the electric side. We're going, to, we're going to take a look and say what's not just 2022, but 2023 and 2024. And I think part of that, that conversation needs to be, um, is there further, further delineation between an upriver territory and an in-town territory? And how do we divide the cost, fixed cost, variable cost, and other things? So it will be on the table. OK. I misunderstood what you said earlier in terms of, uh, so it is possible that the rate, 
the rates for our area could change as a result of the budget, the 2022 budget? Yeah, there's, there's two things that, that are driving that. So the first one is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we look at is just the budget itself. And even if the rates were the same as in the city of Eugene, um, there is likely going to be a rate increase coming this next year. Uh, some of that is just inflationary pressures we're feeling, um, construction costs, um, cost of power. There's a number of things right. that, that are driving that. Even if, if, even if the, the actual rate does not differentiate, we are seeing some pressures that will drive up rates for the next several years probably. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I, I personally have a problem with the COSA study, and I would urge the commissioners to understand what's in that box. Uh, because I don't like our small area being compared to Eugene. There's a South Eugene that's very aerial intensive as far as your service goes. You're aerial out the river road. I think you need to compare us to like facilities in the city of Eugene, not pit us against the average of that whole city. I believe that's what it's doing now, but I, don't, I have not been able to find, and I really haven't asked for, what, what a, give me a list of the classes of service that go into the COSA study. I am going to be pushing for that because I need to understand that. I also need to understand if my electric bill is helping to pay for building infrastructure in Eugene, because the cost, as you said in your last meeting, while, while wildfire mitigation, cost to build underground structure in Eugene is three times what it is to build out here. So I need to know if EWEB is borrowing money, bonded money, and charging me to build facilities because the city of Eugene wants, or you all want to, or whoever, wants to improve the infrastructure, which ought to be done but I don't think I ought to have to pay for some of that. I, and we don't really have to debate this here. I just want to make it known at this point that uh, I'm going to be challenging some of your information between now and the end of the year. Yeah, well, I think that's fair. I, I think um, what we really want to do as a utility and I think what the, what the board would require of, of staff is that there's clarity and transparency around what those differences are and what the comparators are. Um, it's, uh, in, in some ways, it gets a little bit challenging. Uh, we're, we're talking about, for example, out here, we have um, twice the area that we're covering with one-tenth of the customers. Uh, and so it's, it also works the other way around. There are, are some major differences in um, how the costs get divided. I think what you're asking for, though, is a reasonable request, and that's that when we look at cost of service analysis, and especially if we're going to look at different classes of customers, that what charges go and are allocated to those different classes are clear. And I think that's a very fair request, and, and we'll, we'll shoot to satisfy you and your desire to, to know that. Um, and so, and you know, there's, I think it's important to recognize, and I know the board feels this way, we, we feel a connection to the McKenzie Valley. Uh, we've been here a long time. Uh, whenever we make an investment, for example, in our licensing, we make a lot of investments up here that have nothing to do with power. Um, we build campgrounds and we build boat ramps and we, there's a number of things that we invest into the valley that are then spread the other way. Those are spread across our customers the other way. So um, over the long term, we hope that balances out. Um, but I think inherently we do feel like it's more expensive to service a very spread out remote territory versus a dense in, in um, a very dense territory. Whether that results in a different class and, and the cost of service and how those are allocated, we'll try to be very clear and, and then we'll work on the board and work with the board to see if, if that results in a separate rate or not. Okay, thank you for that. One other comment. We've had some discussions between folks relative to not being represented and I understand why we can't be formally represented, but I also believe that some of the onus is on us here. Uh, as a community, we, we're not incorporated. We have no central government. We've got a community center up here that's burned down. Uh, we don't have any organizational structure. OK, 
okay? And that's just one of the challenges that we have, and it's a good thing in some cases. But I believe that if we, if we want to be represented, it's, it's, the ball's in our court to assemble ourselves and then ask Commissioner Schlossberg or whoever to come up and meet with us. I, I don't think that we can expect that you folks are going to just drive up here once a month uh, for an un, unorganized purpose. So I'm just appealing to all of us to say that, you know, if we want to be represented, let's get together and, and then invite the commissioner up here and, and talk. Thank you. Um, I just want to reply to you, Well, I, I believe when I first took, when I first got in office a couple years ago, you did have me up here and I came to one of your meetings and um, I would be happy to come to another meeting and also just know that you can, um, you can email any of the commissioners, you can email me, you can call, um, we're here to answer questions or find out answers to questions that you may have. So just because you don't, you're not able to elect us doesn't mean that you can't reach out to us and that we won't respond. Can the board comment on uh, the cost of service study, the classes, the various classes, it's within the charter to parse out a different residential class? Or is that, do we need to look at board meetings where you're talking about charter issues or other uh, bylaw type issues? I'm not sure, it, it, you, I, I heard someone comment that, you know, you're selling water to Vanita, other resident, that's a residential use out there maybe, but that doesn't seem the same as our standing within eWeb's utility to parse us, to consider us as a separate residential class. And, and I kind of agree with Will that you could look at us, certainly our density, is probably the biggest reason it wasn't mentioned as to why our cost of service is higher. But there are probably areas in Eugene where cost of service is pretty darn high that we would rather be compared to. But, I mean, I'm just wondering, it, does the board think it's possible to divide us out? And is it an administrative issue? Do you guys do cost of service in-house? Or do you con use consulting engineering firms? Uh huh. This last cost of service is. Right. And, and that's available for us to look at any of the nuts and bolts of the study, actually, if we wanted to try to analyze it. Yeah. Okay. If I may, too, one of the things I hope that you do look at is Lane Electric. We had a meeting up here, what, 10 years ago, Will? And uh, we talked about uh, transferring our sure. service. And, and boy, nobody wanted any part of that because Lane Electric's charges are a lot higher than ours. You, you look at their base rate charge. We're $22 a month and they're 35 just to have a meter before you even turn, before you use an ounce yeah. of electricity. Yeah. And if you, when you're doing that, make sure that you look at not just Eugene because we do have different areas like in Eugene and South Eugene where we have to pay a lot more money to pump water up the hill. We charge those people, there's a delivery charge. It's different than it is for the flatland and things such as that. So we, this isn't something that we haven't looked at before, and it, it goes both ways. Yeah, I understand and, and that. So, and and we consider so ourselves part of eWeb from the beginning of time. Right. And, and so, so, uh, you know, so I just wanted to make sure that you knew that uh, uh, at one time we did consider, if people said, you don't want eWeb, fine, uh, Lane Electric's already up here, and, uh, and they're a rural utility, we're an urban utility, 50% of our service area is up here and only 2,300 customers. Yeah, and, I understand. And, and you get the math on what it costs, I mean, when we have an outage and things such as that. So our cards are going to be up. But when we yeah. do this, we're going to make sure we're open and transparent and look at it and, and be fair and equitable. And if, if it's going up, that's fine. And if it's going down, that's fine. But it's got to be fair and it's got to be open and transparent. And we want to make sure that we hear everybody, everybody's side of it. So we'll make sure that we do that. Who, and is there, is, there's no regulation since you're a public utility that applies. Like, like it would, the cost of service studies for private utilities are regulated by the PUC, I believe, right? Yeah. So it's just up to the ratepayers to just make sure that there's nothing that's, you know, 
advantages some special interest. It, yeah, you're, you're, I'll, I'll answer your question directly. There's, there's nothing in the charter that, that um, prohibits looking at different classes. Basically, our PUC is right here. Yeah. Um, this is okay. the, the governing body who determines and we have to get approval for rates for. Uh -huh. um, we do have a number of situations where we have different classes and rates. Uh, for example, on our, in our water utility, we have rates for inside of Eugene versus outside of Eugene, and that's within the city limits. Uh, we have pumping charges because the costs are higher to get water to a different elevation. So there's, there's other okay. standards that we've there, there that, are that facilitate rates. that. And there within are the varying. residential class, there's varying rates. Pardon me? Within the residential class. Yes, that's, that's okay. correct. So it, there's nothing that prohibits, prohibits it. The, the process that I think we're, we're really trying to, to look at here is to develop and understand the costs and the basis for those costs. And like I said earlier, we have to uh, bring things to our governing body, our board, um, not whether we like the outcome or not, but do we trust the process that, we, that we've evaluated and then they can look at it further and say, yes, this makes sense to us or no, it does not. Um, but there's, there's nothing from a charter perspective or a regulatory perspective that prohibits it. And this group here is the one who will decide whether they want to implement something or not. And historically, has the cost of service for up here ever been studied before? Or is it assumed that it's always been greater than service in town? I, I would say if you look at historically, uh, it probably has been what higher about historic. Our, the generation when, when we were generating up here? So the, the generation costs are actually peanut buttered across the entire customer base. Okay. So, so those costs are separated out. Um, those go into what we call production costs. And all customers pay for the, even the production up here or whether that production is up on the Clackamas where we have a facility or whether we buy it from Bonneville. Those are all lumped into production costs. Right. Yeah. Well, no, thank you for being up here. And um, for myself, you know, I enjoy being part of EWA. Thank you. Hi, so first of all, I wanted to thank you as well for coming up to Lieberg and just giving the community the opportunity to, one, meet everybody in person and just have an opportunity to listen and ask questions. So my name is Brandy Crawford Ferguson. I'm a third generation Mackenzie. I actually grew up in Springfield. I live in Hayden Bridge, I'm downstream. Uh, my grandparents came to the Blue River in 1946. My grandfather learned how to be a logger and started a small logging company. I actually work for Mackenzie River Trust, the local land conservation group. I've been with the trust for 12 years. And I just really wanted to thank uh, eWeb for investing in the Mackenzie River. I know growing up, I um, would dinner tube on this river and, you know, fish and go home and fill a glass of water and never even thought about the fact that the river I was just playing on was the same water that I was drinking from at home. You know, we, I didn't make that connection. Honestly, probably really didn't seriously think about it until I started working for the trust. That's really when I started saying, okay, these things are connected, right? This community asset is key to a health a healthy place, a healthy live, uh, livelihood. So Holiday Farm Fire, excuse me, Holiday Farm Fire happened, right, in, in the fall. And um, just wanting to thank, again, the Peer Water Partners Program, which the Trust is a part of, but how quickly um, that program was able to pivot under, um, you know, eWeb's investment. Uh, that was huge. I've had the opportunity to be a part of various statewide communities representing the Holiday Farm Fire and listening to other wildfire communities across the state who do not have a utility investing in their river that's been impacted significantly. So that's been huge and just really want to call that out in addition to eWeb's investment in the McKenzie River Trust and our local um, you know, conservation lands. And Carl, my question. Um, do you mind digging a little bit into the science why eWeb invests in the health of this river by investing in the lands that cradle it? So, is that right? Yes. Sorry. Um, and actually, it's kind of chagrined that I actually left out a whole paragraph that I wrote and I was talking to you guys and it's all about water quality and the McKinsey being the sole source of drinking water, which is actually the most important thing and uh, so focused on trying to uh, make sure 
that we articulated how we do like and want to work with landowners up here um, to protect this precious watershed um, because it is a sole source of drinking, a sole source of drinking water for 200,000 people. But it's more than that, as you all know. It's it's um, it's kind of the heart and soul of uh, of Eweb and of City of Eugene and of the communities that are up here. That's what links us. But the reason we invest in, in lands up here is that we've been up in the Mackenzie in one way or another for, as you've heard, over a hundred years. Um, and we are here for long-term connection and to help grow basically uh, conservation or stewardship uh, with the landowners that are living up here so that you know we can together essentially create something that has longevity and is resilient to future disasters. And so we have an inherent um, interest and, uh, and value chain that, that kind of links us to the McKenzie. Not only do we obviously generate electricity up here, we have power customers up here, we drink the water that comes down. So when you think about it, the water goes through multiple turbines and then we pull it out and drink it. Um, and so it's, it's just a strong connection. I think eWeb has always been interested in investing in the McKenzie and, and, uh, and basically did the initial investment that started McKenzie River Trust back in 2000. So, um, so the land is, is, is key, and how we manage the land impacts, you know, the water quality, it impacts habitat, it impacts uh, what happens when it floods. So, um, yeah, that's the short, longish answer. <laughs> Hopefully I answered your question. I'm not seeing other hands go up, so um, I guess I'll give the, the board another opportunity to comment, but I would also, um, after this, we do have uh, some experts and some tables uh, next door. Um, it, that, that is an indoor type facility, so we are asking people to, to mask up if they go in there, but there's an update on Carmen Smith and some dam safety, not D-A-M-B, but dam as in D-A-M, safety. Um, energy efficiency, holiday farm fire up, there's a number of updates um, on some of our programs over there. Um, but I would also like to give the board an opportunity to, to comment to everybody while they're here and I think after that we'll adjourn to next door or be open for individual questions if people want to talk to us about anything in more detail. I just want to thank everybody again for coming tonight um, and to the staff for the presentations. And again, just encourage you, if you have other questions or comments or concerns, to please reach out to us because that's the only way we know what you're thinking and what you're concerned about. So thank you. I too would like to thank everybody for coming out this evening and uh, Will and others. I'm sure we're going to have a great conversation. And thank you for bringing it up. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you. Yeah. I would ditto everything that's already been said and just know that I will be an advocate for you guys on the board. Uh, as someone new to the board, I am trying to understand all the issues to the best of my ability. And so part of that is learning from you all about what you care about and how you see things. So I too am interested in the conversation, happy to come up and join you for a conversation uh, if that feels useful to you. Um, and I'm committed to understanding the, all the inputs to the best of my ability to the decisions we're making. So I think all of us are in that spot. We're, we're trying to really weigh um, all the information and make the best decision we can on behalf of all of the eWeb customers as well as stakeholders who aren't direct customers. So um, we're still um, learning more and, and uh, thanks for helping me. Yeah, like the other commissioners, I mean, thank you so much for having us up here. Um, we always look forward to coming up and meeting with all of you. Uh, appreciate that you're taking your time out. This is, you know, this isn't something that everybody comes and does. And so to Will's point, you know, the more that you come out and are involved, the more we're motivated to come out and be involved with you. And it, we really appreciate that every time we do come out here, there are people, even in times of crisis, and in times when there isn't crisis, to come out and find out more about what we're doing so we can learn more from you and we can help support what you're doing and you can let us know what the issues are up here that we've missed. So please do feel free to reach out to any of us. We're very open. Um, and 
thank you again for having us up here. I'll just conclude by thanking everybody as well. I, um, I would say that this is normally, this is way more fun than a normal board meeting. Sorry, no offense. Uh, uh, we, we do appreciate it and you know, I, I do um, have the fortunate opportunity or, or unfortunate opportunity to work with a lot of other utilities and what differentiates eWeb and Lane Electric and some of the other public utilities are forums like this. Um, try this with Pacific Core um, and see how far you get. Um, it's, it's part of why a lot of us work for a public utility. It's the connection with the public and the, to recognize it's, it's your money, it's your investments, and you're the people that we serve. And so thank you for coming out and we'll be around for a little while to answer any further questions. But thanks for your questions and opportunity to interact. Have a good evening.